From my side, a warm welcome today. I had the privilege of looking at you all from the back, seeing, seeing your heads. Um, so now I can see your faces as well. We are busy with the third part and the final part of our series, No Pain, No Gain. And I remember a couple of years, this is, this is quite a bit of years back, but when I was in grade eight and nine, I had a, an accounting teacher that was not a great accounting teacher, but he was a pretty cool teacher. So we all loved our accounting teacher, but we, none of us had a clue what was going on in accounting. And then one day, he left like right in the middle of the year. We were a month or two months out from our final exams, and we have no idea what accounting is about, and our favorite teacher just left. So we got moved to a different class. So now we're put so out of our comfort zone, we have to physically move to a different part in the building to a different teacher that is the exact opposite. She was mean. Okay, we walk in there the first day, she wants to know what we know, and basically she tells us that we have no idea what accounting is about. So now I can imagine we're stressed out, she's like, we're all gonna fail exams, and um, it was not a good start. It was, it was discomfort at its peak, right? But this teacher had the most amazing ability to make complicated things so simple that after the two months of her, I never studied for accounting again because it always just made sense. And it is interesting how that experience that was so discomfortable in that moment became an experience through which I grew so much that I finished accounting, I did it all the way through to, um, to grade 12, always had great marks and I still love finances. And the couple, the, the small amount of time that I had with her, although it was uncomfortable, Though it was sometimes even maybe a little painful, I grew so much through it. And it is interesting, a lot of you might have experienced this where you switch to a different teacher or you might have switched to a different coach or a different manager or a different job that put you out of your comfort zone. But when you're in this new place, although it's not easy, you experience incredible growth in it. I don't know if you've been in that position, but that is kind of like the way life often goes. Sometimes we don't always see what pain can teach us in the moment, but more often than not, when we look back, we see that we have grown somehow through the pain that we have gone through. And we, in this last part, I want to quickly recap what we've said, and that will make sense how we get to today's topic. We said comfort is overrated, right? If you hope to find joy and happiness in life by just acquiring things that you think will make you comfortable, you're going to be disappointed each time. It's overrated. It doesn't bring joy. You will keep feeling empty. You will keep being without happiness and joy in your life, no matter how much stuff you add to your life that makes your life more comfortable. The second week, we said discomfort is underrated. Because we can actually grow through discomfort, but it's interesting that two people can go through a very similar kind of discomfort and one grows and the other one not. And what is the difference? One had a right attitude and one had the wrong attitude. So we said, let's have the right attitude and view our discomfort as opportunities to grow. Let's see God in it. Let's not believe that God is against us, but let's know that He's still for us. We, he's with us in our pain and that good come from, can come from it. But today I want to end the last part of this series with the question that's been on our mind the whole time. Can there come... Can there really be good from discomfort? What kind of good can we experience? Now, there's always unique things in discomfort, but I want, to be talk, I want to talk today about four specific lessons that no matter what discomfort, no matter what pain or hardship you go through, those things are always possible um, to learn from discomfort. So before we read, I ask you in the previous two weeks, be a self feeder be a mature adult, take your Bibles, open it, and read the story of Joseph. It's a young man that we're reading about in this series. So in the first week, I asked you to read Genesis, um, it was 38, 9, 40, I think, 41, maybe another one. There was four chapters. Second week, last week, I asked you to read from chapter 41 to chapter 45. If you didn't read that, you're going to miss out a bit on the background, okay? I'll give you a short breakdown, but you missed some juicy parts. So this week, I want to encourage you to read the final part of the story of Joseph, um, chapter 46 to 50. You can read one chapter a day, it's five days, it's short chapters, and 
you can only grow through it and, and learn some new things. But let me give you some background on, on Joseph. So we, we quickly backtrack. Joseph is a young, arrogant man of 17, living in all the comforts his father could give him. His brothers hate him so much for his arrogance that they sell him as a slave. They actually originally planned to kill him. They sell him as a slave. He ends up in the house of a government official in Egypt where he works his way to the top to be in charge of the whole house. This, his master's wife, has a thing for Joseph. She wants him to have an affair with her. He says no. So she tells a story that he tried to rape her. He didn't, but he ends up in jail anyway. For years, he's in jail. He works his way up through jail so that later, as a prisoner, he's put in charge of the whole prison. And finally, he gets to stand in front of the Pharaoh of Egypt to tell him what the meaning is of a dream that God gave Pharaoh. And he gets put in charge of the whole of Egypt. That's what we read this week if you read the stories. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, we've got Bibles for you. or You can download the app on your phone, but don't let that be an excuse. But anyway, he's put in charge of the whole of Egypt. He hasn't seen his family in years. And then finally... His brothers show up. His dad is like, you're not taking the youngest. I already lost Joseph. I'm not going to send him. So just some of his brothers show up. They don't know who he is. And they ask him for food. So he does this whole trick. He sends them back home. He says, like, I want your youngest brother to come as well. Um, And he sends some of them back. He keeps one of them prisoner. His dad is like, I'm not sending my youngest son. I'm sorry. Like, oldest one can can rot in prison. I'm like... (laughs) So he stays in prison with Joseph. Finally, they have no more food because there's famine in the land. For seven years, there's a drought, okay? So that is like, you have to go back. They're like, we can't go back without the youngest brother. So that is like, okay, go back. They appear before Joseph. He gives them food. He sends them back, but puts their money and some of his stuff in their bags. Then sends soldiers after them to stop them. So these brothers open their bags. They thought they were innocent. Suddenly, there's all these stolen things in the bags, and they're like, we're going to die. So they go back, they have to meet with Joseph, that they don't know is Joseph at this time. They have to meet with him in his house, and they know this is the end of us, right? We're not going to make it past this meeting. He already thought we were a spy, now he thinks we're thieves, he's going to kill us or throw us in prison. But we're going to read today from Genesis 45, verse 4 to 8, his response to his brothers, the same brothers that sold him into slavery, We're going to be reading his response. Genesis 45, verse 4. Please come closer, Joseph said to them. Oh, by the way, he's now sent all of the Egyptians out because they shared a story of the dad. And then they got to Joseph and what happened to him. And his heart just broke. So he sent everyone out. And then he tells his brothers, please come closer. So they came closer. And then he said to them, I am Joseph, your brother, the one whom you sold into slavery in Egypt. But don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves for selling me to this place. It was God who sent me here ahead of you to preserve your lives. This famine that has ravaged the land for two years will last five more years and there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God has sent me ahead of you to keep you and your families alive And to preserve many survivors. So it was God who sent me here, not you. And he is the one who made me an advisor to Pharaoh. The manager of his entire palace. And the governor of all of Egypt. Have you ever been in a painful situation? And in that moment, you know, you've heard all those stories. God makes all things work out. To the good of those who love him and are like, I have no idea how any good can come from this pain I'm going through. Maybe it was bad news about your health. Maybe it had something to do with your finances or a relationship that fell apart. I don't know what your story might be. But if you've ever been in that spot where in the moment you're like, I don't know how anything good can come from it. I want to tell you, you're not alone. We've all been there. It is hard to see what good can come from a moment when you are naked in a cistern and your own brothers want to kill you. It is hard to see any hope when you're sold as a slave and you can't even make decisions about your own life anymore. It is hard to see hope when you're put in jail for a crime you didn't commit. 
And often we cannot see what good can come from this. But Joseph learned some lessons, I think, the hard way through living through life's comforts and then life's discomforts. And now he's on a high. He's at the comfort. But although he has some comfort in the palace, he still has this discomfort of, I haven't seen my family in years. So through all of these ups and downs of his life, I believe he learned some valuable lessons. And I want to look at four of those lessons today that I think we can take with us. So that in times when you believe there will be no light at the end of the tunnel, when you think I can't learn anything from this, nothing good can come from this, these will be some reminders you can carry with you. The first lesson I think Joseph learned was that he was not as great as he thought. You see, when things are going well in life, when finances are doing well and my relationships are doing well and my children are obeying and everything feels good, We feel so in control, right? It feels like everything is just working out. We're confident. But what we don't realize in that moment is that often that confidence and that feeling in control is actually us being all self-absorbed without even knowing it and actually being super fragile. And this is just a moment where everything seems to be working fine and my... My little fragile life isn't falling apart. But then when something goes south and I lose control, that's when things really start falling apart and I feel like I have no more control over my life and I realize how fragile I truly am, right? And we don't want to acknowledge this. So here is the interesting thing I think that all of us do in times of pain, in times of hardship, in times of discouragement. We try to take it away from ourselves because we are all a little self-absorbed and we don't want to acknowledge that we are fragile. So what do we do? We instinctively blame others. Yes, my finance is in a bad spot because someone else did it to me. Like my, my wife took my credit card or the dog ate my wallet or my boss didn't give me the promotion, right? We blame someone else. It's not my fault. It's not I who didn't budget. We speak harshly to innocent people. We make... We, we take all of our anger out on them, often our family members, those who are closest to us. We argue about the smallest things. We demand, demand our way. We try to control all the little things in our life in order to just feel like I have a bit of control about something. Often we wallow in self-pity and we harbor bitterness just because we can't acknowledge how fragile we actually are. Can you remember... The first week in chapter, what was it, 38, that 17-year-old arrogant boy who told his fathers and his brothers how they, his father and brothers, how they're going to bow before him. He was so arrogant that his brothers wanted to kill him, that his dad said, like, what's wrong with you? I think when you step into this place where he is actually ruling over Egypt just under the Pharaoh, you won't encounter that arrogant young man. Because I think somewhere along the line, he realized that when things get out of control, if my obsession is to be in control of everything, my own life will start to fall apart. It will break me and it will break the relationships in my life. So he gave up his control, right? He stopped doing it. He realized that when he was sold as a slave and he had no control, God still had control over his life. He realized that when he was put in prison and he was trapped, God wasn't trapped by the bars. He realized that when he became an advisor to Pharaoh, it was not his own greatness. And I'm I'm guessing he was a great leader because everywhere he went, he worked himself up. But he realized it was not he that was so great, but it was God that positioned him there. See, but this is the first lesson I think any kind of discomfort, any kind of pain, any hardship in your life can and should teach you. And that is, it shows me that I'm not as great as I thought. I'm not as in control. I'm not as strong. I'm not the rock everyone thought I am. We need to learn to be a little more vulnerable with our own weaknesses. Because unless we learn this, we don't, won't, we'll never learn that we need to depend on someone else to help me. I'll just continue to try to fix more things and shift more blame. The second lesson 
Joseph learned is he learned to be grateful for the things he had. I read the story and I'm like, why didn't he just kill his brothers? They wanted to kill him. Or why didn't he put them in jail? Or sell them as slaves? But when you read the interaction that he has with, with his brothers, he's like, is dad still alive? He, didn't, he couldn't ask that. So he's like, is your father still alive? I'm like, yes, he's old, but he's still kicking. He asked them about the youngest brother. He had all these things that he wanted to know about. I'm like, why? How could he embrace them and forgive them and see all of his life as, as good? And I realized it's because when his sense of entitlement faded, he started to see the blessings that God already instilled on his life. Right at the beginning, when he was a young man, he had these dreams of how his brothers would actually bow before him. It was God showing him that I've got a plan for your life. He didn't realize it at the, at the moment. He was just arrogant and self-absorbed and his brothers hated it for him. But at this moment, after losing so much, you can say, how is someone whose brothers want to kill him, that's been thrown in the system, that's been sold as a slave, that's been imprisoned for a wrong he didn't commit, how is a person like that blessed? How can I be blessed when all of these things fall apart in my life, when my finances are going south, or when I got news that I'm terminally ill or when a family member doesn't want to speak to me how can there be any blessings in my life the thing is there is there's always blessings in our life and I think that is what Joseph realized and that's why he acted differently because when we get to the end of ourselves, when I realized that I'm fragile, when I realized that I was all self-absorbed, and when I realized that everything is not as dark as I believed, I start to see things like, my, like love in my life, health in my life, salvation, time, friendships, all of those things that I used to take for granted. I start to see them and I start to value them. And instead of complaining about all of the things that God didn't give me, the things that God should have done for me, I start to thank Him for the things He did give me and the things He has done for me. It changes my perspective. I thought about this when I was preparing. If you were on a plane and you just got news, the engines are gone, three minutes, and it will be in the ocean, we're all going to die but you've got cell phone reception. Okay, you take your phone out. What are you gonna do in the th three minutes? Call your wife, hey, I just wanna tell you, this pilot, he's useless, and this plane, like, I don't even know who built this plane, but this plane is going down, and I like how, no! We're not gonna go that way, right? If the plane is going down, I'm gonna call my wife, and I'm gonna tell her how much I love her, and how, what the blessing she is to me. No matter how much bad we have in our life, discomfort, hardship, pain, there's always blessings, but we tend to allow the hardships to overshadow everything that's good. Joseph could have allowed his brother's hatred towards him when he was younger to overshadow his whole life, but he didn't. He chose to value that which God did give him. A family, although it was broken, a job, a life, health, whatever it might be. And I think that is the second lesson. Discomfort teaches me that I have many things to be grateful for. But I need to open my eyes to it. I need to first decide that I'm going to stop complaining to God about all the things He didn't give me and start thanking Him for the things He did give me. Maybe it's time for you to start taking, making a journal and every morning write down 10 things that you are grateful for. But I think often God does allow, we said last week, right? He doesn't always rescue us from our pain, but He always takes us through our pain. But I think part of the reason why God sometimes allows the hurt and the brokenness and the pain we go through is because without brokenness, without hurt, without pain, we don't get to that point, that moment, where I realize that when I have Jesus and Jesus have me, then that is enough. See, sadly, we often have to get to the end of ourselves. To the end of our entitlement to realize that Jesus is enough. It's interesting how people that's been killed for their faith knows it so well. And people in countries where we have religious freedom struggle so much with that little concept. 
But I want to remind my hardship. I want to thank my hardship for reminding me that I have a lot to be grateful for. And you don't have to go looking forward to see that there's people who's, who's got it way worse than you do. But the third lesson that Joseph learned was he learned to be more compassionate towards others. You remember at the beginning how arrogant he was towards other people? Oh, I'll rule over you. you you'll bow before me. Like, look at my fancy robe. If you go and read his story this week, you'll see some of the interaction that he and his family had. And he gave them great pasture fields and all kinds of things. But then finally, his father dies. So his brothers are like, oh man, this is the end of us. Okay, He was nice to us because dad was still alive. But now that dad is dead, like, we're done for it. So they go to Joseph and they're like, we will be your slaves. We know you've given us land. We know we're wealthy now, but we'll be your slaves. Okay? He didn't say anything. They just they had such a guilty conscience. But this is how he responds in Genesis 50, verse 19 to 21. Joseph replied to them, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can pan- punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. No, don't be afraid. Hear this. I will continue to take care of you and your children. This is probably one of my favorite parts is the next line. So he reassured them. By speaking kindly to them. This feels very different than the arrogant little brat. I think often we think like, oh, I'm just born without empathy. I'm just born without compassion. No, I don't have it. No, compassion, I think, is a gift from God. And it is a character trait that can grow inside of all of us, that should grow in you if you're a Christian. And sometimes hardship and pain helps us as we're experiencing kindness from other people that help us through it. We, something happens inside of us, right? We grow in our compassion because now we want to help someone else as well. Because I've been helped. I've been shown compassion. And this is not just me saying it, but the Bible actually talks about it. That when we experience God's comfort, we can comfort other people. In 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 to 5, it says, God is our merciful Father and the source of all comfort. He, hear this, He comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that we can comfort others. When they are troubled, we will be able to give them the same comfort God has given us. For the more we suffer for Christ, the more God will shower us with His comfort through Christ. It is interesting that often in the places where you find people to be suffering the most, you find the most compassionate people. During the height of COVID, we had lines 8 kilometers to 15 kilometers long of people that queued to get food. Because South Africa is a country where a lot of people live hand to mouth. They don't have savings, they don't have all of that. But then we had refugees from the Congo and Rwanda and places like that that were part of our church that used to have fairly good jobs. They were Uber drivers and stuff. But there's no care for them because the government doesn't do that. And it's interesting, I would call one of the guys in our church who's one of the most compassionate people I've ever met. 21 years old. He takes care of his whole family. A sister, a brother, and his two parents. He was an Uber driver, and he would pick people up, and then talk so much about church, they asked him to bring him to church on the Sunday. So we always had these random guests from all over the world that he brought to church. And, and we want to ask him how he's doing, and he's like, oh, it's been a great week. We had a meal, one meal every day. And later when we started gathering again, he only had a conversation with one of these ladies, um, And she said, you know what, I thank God 
for the times when I have no food, when I have to go to bed hungry, because that reminds me how people feel that never have food. I'm like, how can you be thankful for that? But he taught them something about having compassion for people with less, people in a deeper hole. People who do not see the end, the light at the end of the tunnel. People who do not know Jesus, who cannot go to him and find rest in him. And that is what Paul is saying, is God is comforting you for a reason. And everywhere around us, there's people that are like sponges, soaking up, looking at us, wanting to know how are you going to react to hardship? How are you going to react to difficulty? How are you going to react to pain? And they are looking at us to see if it is worth being a Christian, if it makes a difference at all. They are eager to find ways to handle pain in different ways, but to look at us to find it. And I believe we need more people in our communities that are beacons of hope, showing people what it means to get through pain, to get through what it means to get through hardship with more joy, more love, and even more purpose than before. Because that is what Jesus enables us to do. And if you're not a Christian, I want to encourage you. If you just have to start seeking Jesus out for this, that's already enough. Because Jesus came so that we can live life in a different way. And when you're at your lowest low like Joseph and you think there's no way out, God already has a way out for you. And we get to share that with the world. So through discomfort, I grow in my compassion towards others. That's the third lesson that we get to learn. But the fourth lesson links in with the, third, with the first one. And that is, I believe that after Joseph realized that it was not as great as he thought, he realized that then he needs someone who is greater than he could ever imagine. See, we think we know what God wants for us. We think we know what God knows. And we normally have these arguments with God about it as well. If you're a Christian, you might have prayed one of those prayers where you're like, God, this is the problem I have and you can just fix it by doing this for me. We like want to inform him how we should fix our problems, right? Like if you just give me that raise or if you just send me that kind of a girl, then I'll be fine. We, we think like we know everything that God knows. And then when discomfort is, we're like, oh, either I'm angry at God or I'm like, I actually have no idea what God is planning because this is not how I would have done it. We don't have a clue what God is up to. Because we can't comprehend how God weaves the flaws and the evil and the brokenness and the sin of this world into a beautiful tapestry. Something redemptive, something beautiful. And I think the moment that we realize, the moment that I realize that I don't know everything, that I'm not as great as I thought, that is the moment that I've got the ability to either then be stuck in my crisis or to look up and to say, God, I need you to intercede. I need a superhuman savior. I need someone that surpasses the time and space, that surpasses my problems and the giants that I'm facing. I need someone that can help me through this, that sees the bigger picture, that understands more because I'm incapable of seeing it. See, Joseph, in his answer to his brothers, it's, it's very interesting. When he talks about the discomforts he went through, he's like, oh, this was actually like a plan that God had for my life to save others. He doesn't say, oh, you sold me as a slave. He says, God sent me ahead of you. So for him, when he's looking back, he's like, the discomfort I experienced was a sign that I was actually making progress. My discomfort reveals how much greater God is than I could ever imagine. How little I can understand of God's ways and His plans. And guys, if, if that frustrates you because you can't understand God, the only way you can understand God is if you had a little God that you created for yourself. That's the size of your own brain. 
I love the fact that I get to serve a God that is so much bigger than my comprehension and all the studies I can ever do about God and about the Bible. I love the fact that I can't comprehend Him because that means that when my plans run out, that when my strength runs out, when I can't see a future anymore, I serve a God who still can see a future, whose plans didn't run out, who still knows what's ahead. We can't grow We can't get better without some form of discomfort. Think about it, right? You can't get fit without the discomfort of stretching your runs a little further and further or picking up heavier weights and having sore muscles the next day. You can't get a better guitar player without developing some calluses on your fingers. There's so many things in life where it's so obvious, like I can't get better if I'm not willing to face some form of discomfort. I couldn't get better in accounting if I wasn't willing to face the discomfort of having a rather nasty teacher, but a great one. So you might not like the path of discomfort. And I'm not trying to say through this series that the discomfort and the pain you're experiencing is nothing. It might be really significant. It might be big. Joseph faced significant hardship and pain in his life as well. So I'm not trying to downplay what you're going through. Therefore, I want to say, yes, it might be hard. It might be uncomfortable. It might not be the path that you would have chosen. But we can choose to humbly accept That God is weaving it, my pain, my hurt, my discomfort into something beautiful. I can choose to believe that there's a redemptive story unfolding in my own life. So I want to challenge you, whatever you're facing, to think about that. To think about those four things. How can your pain teach you that you're not as great as you thought? How can your pain help to shrink yourself in your own view? Secondly, how can your pain help you to be more grateful for the things that God has blessed you with, that He has given you? Thirdly, how can your pain help you to be more compassionate towards others? And lastly, how can your pain help you to grow your view of God in your own mind. Let's pray. Oh Jesus, I know that I wouldn't always choose the path of pain and hurt and suffering and discomfort. But I know it's part of this life because We live in a broken and a fallen world. And therefore, although it might not be my choice, I choose to surrender to you. I choose to find rest in you. I choose to trust you. I choose to trust that you see a future that I cannot even imagine yet. I choose to believe that you are weaving a beautiful tapestry out of all of our brokenness. I pray today for everyone sitting here, everyone listening online, you know their pain, you know their hardship, their discomfort. I pray, Jesus, that you would help us to not grow tired and weary, but that you will carry us through it and that you will help us grow through it. So that we will have a better understanding of who you are. But may we also use our own discomfort. And the comfort we receive from you. To share it with a world that is in such desperate need. Of a superhuman savior. Jesus we love you. And we honor you. For the fact that you are bigger than us. We pray in your name. Amen.